those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Stilp. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton. Um, so feel free to come visit me or ask me questions about our library resources. We have a lot of really great free things that you can get for free with your library card. Um, if you didn't grab a flyer on your way in, we do have one um, that talks about our next talk, which is on December 7th. It's going to be related to immigration and finding your immigrant ancestor and figuring out re what records they have once they've decided to become a United States citizen. And it ties in with an exhibit that we're going to have on the Wisconsin German experience. Um, it's going to run almost the whole month of December. It's going to start December 4th and run to the end of the month. Um, so feel free to come to the library anytime we're open to explore that awesome exhibit. Um, that's all, December 7th is also the morning of the Historical Society's um, History Fair that they have, and it's going to be related to World War I and World War II, and that's over across the street in the city center from 9.30 in the morning until 12.30. Or 9, 9 until 12.30, sorry. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank the friends of the Appleton Library for supporting our awesome programs. Um, today's program is actually supported by Badger Talks, which is in um, partnership with UW Madison. Um, and so that's how we got our awesome speaker today, Dorothea Salvo. Um, Dorothea is a faculty associate at UW Madison, and she teaches about digital information in the information school. She actually taught me all I know about being a librarian. Um, so she teaches everything from online privacy and security to relational database design. She's also built Recover Analog and Digital Data, which she's going to talk a little bit about today. Um, that saves personal, family, and community history in Wisconsin from decaying 20th century media such as VHS tapes and floppy disks. So, everybody, welcome to the Hi, thank you for coming. I'm really glad to be here, and I want to throw some love back at Katie and at Appleton Public Library because, uh, as Katie told you, I, I teach people to be librarians, among other things. And the library here has always been so very supportive of our students. We have quite a few students who do their internships, their practicums here, and uh, there is some scholarship money that, that uh, comes from Appleton, and we are just, we are just very grateful. So thank you um, to the library and to the Appleton community for that. So yes, I do want to talk briefly about Badger Talks because Badger Talks is awesome. Um, any organization here in the state of Wisconsin can take a look at the speakers and the topics that are available through Badger Talks and bring one of us uh, from the UW-Madison to you at no cost to you, covered by the university. So uh, there's like an incredible cornucopia, <laughs> really, really amazing, very, very cool stuff um, and cool people that you can bring to your organization for free. And for me, this is a privilege and a pleasure. I love to come talk to folks in Wisconsin about what I do. Which, among other things, um, is my work hobby here. And you can kind of almost see a little bit in the back, a little bit of the machinery there. It's grown about fourfold from this photo, which I should really replace. It's like two server racks now. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it's called Recover Analog and Digital Data. And it exists because um, there's a terrible problem around 20th, 21st century information carriers that cultural heritage organizations such as libraries, archives, museums are just starting to get to grips with. And that's the we, and very likely you, have a lot of things like this, right? Most folks recognize this. I Oh, sure. I do, too. Um, People keep giving them to me. Can't imagine <laughs> why. <laughs> so the 20th century was a time of an incredible flowering of um, media containing physical things. There should be a better word for this, and I, I, if there is, I don't know what it is. Um, all kinds of things invented, and it wasn't enough to invent it once, then you had to make it better. 
And of course, the better thing is never backwards compatible with the, with the thing that was first invented. So um, that leaves all of us, it isn't just libraries, archives, museums, all of us with an awful lot of information that is one, trapped on things like this, if we don't do something about it. And two, things like this were not really made to last. Right? They're all kind of, you know, this actually isn't bad. Cassette tape, not bad as these things go. We want to talk not made to last. Five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Who remembers these bad boys? I do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I take my, my, my rigs, for example, to the, the Madison Mini Maker Fair, and there are, you know, kids. Um, and I'm like, it's called a floppy disk because it does this. And they're fascinated. <laughs> um, by the way, if any of you have slide collections, children are fascinated <laughs> by photographic slides. I didn't know this until I went to a maker fair and had a few slides with me. And you were just like, ooh, little pictures. I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> um, who knew? Anyway, the piece of paper. I gave you, and I will leave some copies with Katie because I understand that there were people who were hoping to come today and couldn't make it. This is actually an exercise I do with my undergraduates in a class I often teach called Introduction to Digital Information. And it's, I, I do this with them because they haven't thought about it. I mean, of course they haven't. They're 18. Why would they have thought? Um, so I asked them, you know, if somebody had to reconstruct your life from, you know, available documentation, what's out there? And then I say, think about the same question, but for your parents. And then on the back, it's the same question, just generations previous to that. For the folks in this room right now, I would actually encourage you to, to use this back side to think about your children and grandchildren and what they have. Right, what documents their life that might be different from what documents yours. <laughs> because I'm guessing, but I, I feel like it's a pretty solid guess. Um, many families, mine hardly least, have kind of one person who's the keeper of the family history. <laughs> I'm suspecting that's quite a few of you in this room. So if you don't skill up your, your kids and your grandkids about how to deal with this stuff so that it isn't lost, you know, they might end up in my class, but they might not. So please, anything you learn today, spread it far and wide. Because there is an awful lot of personal, family, community, history at risk. And the time to save it, a lot of it, really is now. Talk more about that in a little bit. So I know some of you have been, you know, scratching your head and making marks. So let me ask. Um, Who's got newspaper magazine clippings for yourself or anyone in your family? Quite a few of you. Yep. Why is my pen not working? Okay. Handwritten letters, postcards. Not surprised. Anything else in the physical document line that I'm not thinking of? Photographs. We'll get there. Land records. Ooh, yeah. And do you have actual uh, photocopies or other copies? Okay, cool. So yeah, legal documents. Mm -hmm. Religious documents. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, photographs, already been mentioned, so I assume that's a thing. And I saw some people nodding about photographic slides, so I'll talk about those. Um, just got photographs that are visual only. Never printed. Most people do. Um, sound. Anybody have sound recordings? Katie says yes. You? Um, out of curiosity, what are they on? Is that tape? My computer. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Answering machine tapes. Anybody dig those up? 
Yeah, I'll tell you a little story about those. I, uh, I have a student, one of, one of our information school students, our master's students, come to me and say, I have this answering machine today that I would, I have nothing to play on. And that's part of the problem right there, right? Even if these were made to last, how many people still have a cassette deck? Um, and, I mean, cassette decks, all right, cassette decks are not that rare. Open reel tape. Who's got a reel to reel deck? A few of you? Yeah. Didn't think it was going to be many. I'll talk about those too. Wow. Um, right, so a student came to me with an answering machine tape and said, can you digitize this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so we popped it in the microcassette player, and we connected it up to the audio interface, digitized it, no problem. Um, so she sat there with, in, in front of my Rube Goldberg rig, with the earphones on and just tears rolling down her face. And she said, this is the first time I have ever heard my grandmother's voice. Um, yeah. Moments like that might be why I do what I do. Um, how about film or video? Film? A few? Video? Video. All right. What kind of video? Got to, got, got to be bad boys? Mini DV? VHS. VHS. OK. <coughs> uh-huh. Oh, you got that. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, 16 millimeter. Um, and then TV. Um, does anybody have? Seriously, you got beta? Rock on. <laughs> Not common, but you know, run into it before. Um, right. So, um, the thing about full-size VHS tapes is that building a camcorder around them was a really bad idea because it would come out like weighing 40 pounds and impossible to put on your shoulder. So there's a smaller VHS tape called the VHS Compact, VHS-C. Anybody got those? Okay. Those are easier to deal with than you think. All right. Now we get to the digital stuff. Did I miss anything, by the way? Anything non-digital that people have? All right, so who actually has these bad ones? <laughs> a few of you have any idea what even is on it? Yeah, the thing, the thing about this thing is this one um, does have a label with the incredibly informative numeral nine. <laughs> I have no idea. I have never actually checked. This is my box of, of demo things, so I don't actually care what happens to it. Um, how about three and a half? Do those? Yeah. Pretty common. Um, yeah. When three and a half inch floppies became passe for a very short time, I Omega zip disks, blue screen of death. <laughs> oh no, these are uh, Windows is the blue screen of death. These are the click of death. Yeah, good old click of death. Um, any other odd data formats that people have? There were a lot of them. Vinyl. Vinyl, good. Um, so who's got family history on social media? Facebook, Instagram, whatever, quite a few, not surprising. Um, how many of you have stuff like on your computer? Most, almost all of you. Please tell me you back it up. <laughs> um, that's important, please do that. All right. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good assortment. That'll keep me busy a while, good. So with any of these formats, analog or digital, you're basically 
interfacing three questions. Question number one, am I storing this thing right? Because a lot of these are vulnerable to specific environmental hazards. Cassette tapes, for example, you know not to leave these in on the dashboard of your car because they will melt. Um, so that's an example of the kind of thing that can happen. Vinyl, of course, you're careful, you're, you handle it carefully because you can break it. Um, you don't hand it to your three-year-old because they will break it. Um, so it's question one, are you storing it correctly in a way that's not going to cause unnecessary damage to it? Question two, can, do I need any special equipment in order to, to use this thing? For, hey, come on in. For a photograph, no. If there's a light source, you can just look at it. Um, for you know, most of the physical documents that you have, same deal. You can just pick it up and read it whenever. With this, however, if you don't have a cassette player, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> nothing you can do with it. And speaking of that Betamax tape, um, for a number of these formats, and Betamax is definitely one, the equipment is getting real, real scarce. Um, it's, of course, it's not made new anymore. You cannot buy an innovative patch player that it's not a thing. Trust me. Um, I do have a Betamax player in my rad rig. It's one of the most expensive pieces of equipment in the rig. Um, how much should I pay for that one? I think it's around 300 bucks for a working one. Um, yeah. Um, anything digital, really, uh, for anything of this nature. If you don't have the drive that it goes with, you're out of luck. There is nothing you can do. Um, and, you know, techie people being the, the, the shiny, loving scamps they are, uh, digital equipment tends to go obsolete in rather more quickly than I wish it did. Um, how many folks in, the, in this room have laptops? Laptop computers, most of you? Um, for your laptop computers, how many still have a CD, DVD drive? Yeah, about half the number of people who still have laptops. Those are on their way out. Um, if you have CDs, DVDs uh, with family history, the time to rip them is now. Um, if you're worried about this, uh, you can still buy external USB optical drives, super cheap, um, that's fine. But that will stop being the case, I would guess, in five years. Um, you'll still be able to buy used ones more or less indefinitely, but uh, yeah, take care of those now. All right, so question one is, are you storing it correctly? Question two is, do I need any special equipment? Question three is, how much should I worry about this thing? <laughs> um, and as folks were filtering in here today, um, I was hearing people who already have worries about some of the things that they have. Um, physical documents, for example, ink phase. Ink phase. Um, some kinds of paper are sturdier and more durable than others. Uh, General rule of thumb, rag paper is much sturdier and likelier to last than, than wood paper. Um, if it's actually archival quality paper, hey, that's awesome. But it isn't always. Um, so you probably have some things in your, in your possession that will last centuries, um, if properly stored and other things that are kind of in trouble already because of things like ink fading, um, because of things like uh, Polaroid. Anybody got Polaroid type photos? Uh, those are terrible. Uh, because again, they were not really made to last. They were made to be cool in the way that you didn't need an entire dark room <laughs> to deal with them. 
but the, the, the chemicals in the inks just really, really not big. The, the colors just get incredibly distorted um, over time. So those are the three questions. All right, take those with you. Um, am I storing it correctly? Do I need any special equipment? And how much trouble is this particular format in? So what I'm going to do now is walk through the formats that folks have told me that they have and just answer those three questions and walk through for the ones that are in trouble and you should worry about it, what you can do. So physical documents. Um, cool is never a bad thing. Dry is never a bad thing. All right, most of you have probably heard this before. Damp is scary, keep them dry. Um, heat is scary, keep them cool. If you notice fading, try to keep it out of the light as much as you can. Um, so yes, dark is good, cool is good, dry is good. Uh, if you notice fading, can you digitize it? Can you scan it or can you um, take a digital photograph of it? Yes, you absolutely can. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. Can you arrest the, um, the fading? Can you stop it? And not without a chemical engineer around, usually. I will plug uh, quickly, let me find the right tab here. If you're looking for the supplies that archivists use, to, to preserve things, I can absolutely recommend Gaylord, gaylord.com. This is where archives buy a lot of their, um, their equipment. So just on this page, storage boxes, folders, sleeves of protectors, um, so conservation supplies, if you're really, really serious about it. Um, good stuff, good stuff. Oh, did anybody mention textiles? Who's got old wedding dresses? A few of you? Yeah, they, uh, Gaylord also does uh, textile preservation supplies. Um, as far as those are concerned, it's very much the same idea. Keep it in the dark, keep it cool, keep it dry. Um, dry cleaners actually are a wonderful resource for, um, for textiles and textile care. They, they usually know what they're talking about. All right, questions? I'll get to photographs and slides in a sec, but just for documents, yeah. What if the, do I have some property, legal documents, mm -hmm. very old ones that did get wet, and have some Ooh. old ones that I keep them separate from other stuff. But. Right, which is good, which is good. Um, when something gets damaged, uh, definitely keep it away from, from other stuff that hasn't been. What? I would say you want to come in a pro on this one. But for what it's worth, um, when, some, when documents in an archives room, library, special collections, or whatever get water damaged, um, we actually outsource it to, to places that, that know how to do this. But frequently what happens is that you freeze it. You freeze it. Um, if you have. If the paper is actually stuck together, right, if it's gotten wet and it's stuck together, call it a pro. Um, you, don't, you don't want to deal with that. There's like almost nothing that can go right and everything can go wrong with that. Um, if you can pull stuff apart, then um, sheets of, between sheets of newspaper to dry it out um, is, is what a lot of people do. But uh, yeah, that kind of scares me, and I would go to a professional. Two things. I've got um, flat math books yep. from the 1890s that I just got. Right. So get that into an archival storage box. Get that into an archival storage box, yep. Family Bible. Same. 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 And I have stock certificates that my great grandfather bought that are 120 years old. Nice. And they're just, I haven't done anything with them. So no, that's OK. Them. So yes, same. same. Get in the sleeve, I think makes a lot of sense. And then in a box from there. Yep. So I had a, a big box for my uncle mm -hmm. who lived on a farm and the smell was atrocious. Now oh. we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, and I'm a librarian, not an archivist, so I don't 
have the world's greatest answer. Um, out of curiosity, what kinds of things were in that box? Letters and pictures. Letters and pictures. Mm. They're dirty too. They yeah. Um, but I suspect they're priceless. They probably are. Well, and they're certainly priceless to you. Uh, and that matters. All right, that's important. Um, dried them out, I'm guessing. And did any of the detritus, could you brush it off? That's what I'm starting with. That's where I would start, yeah. And with, with a very soft brush, you don't want to, um, anything particularly harsh. Um, I don't have any super great ideas beyond that, but I'm going to write that down and I will email Katie. I have archivists I can ask about this kind of thing. Could you just scan them? You could, but you'd almost certainly want to clean them first, not least because the, the dirt on the scanner is not the world's greatest idea. All right, I have to make a note of that. I love coming to these things because I always hear things I haven't thought about before. All right. Um, photos and slides. Do you want to have 10 okay. types? I have 10 types. 10 types, yeah. Those actually. And they've got two guys. Yeah, that's the, that's the trick. Um, I would. Uh, you know, I have a friend at Northeast Document Conservation Center that I can actually ask about tintypes. Um, you can digitize them. It just takes fiddling around with, with the scanner. I had a, a, a student in my Intro to Digital Information class from a uh, physics department. That was her major. And, and she came in with um, astronomical glass plate negatives. Like, literally from telescopes, which was so cool. <laughs> uh, those are actually easy to throw them on a scanner, uh, if you're careful. Like, they are glass. Um, but uh, it came out beautiful. And they're negative, so in the software you flip it to positive, but that's, that's easy, that's what software is for. So, photographs. Um, the clock is ticking, but not too hard on most of those. If they're not Polaroids, the clock is ticking very, very fast on Polaroids. Please get them digitized. Um, for, uh, for darkroom type uh, black and white color photos, though, those, can, those will be alright if they were printed on a piece of paper for actually quite a long time. Um, digitize them anyway, sure. If only so that you can share them with the rest of your family. Um, but I'm not super worried about, about those. Slides, keep them cool, keep them dry. Um, it's not so much the, the, the photographic slide material itself as those cardboard sleeves, which love to stick to one another. That is the most annoying thing. <laughs> but they'll be fine. I'm not super worried about those. Um, yeah, I'll just hear a bunch of this. All right. <coughs> Sound recordings. Here is where question two, do you have the equipment, is <laughs> really, really important. Um, question three, how much should I worry, is also very, very salient here, because for a lot of these things, yeah, you should kind of worry. Um, I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine in Madison. His name is Joel Holder, and he runs Holder Printworks, holderprintworks.com. And basically, family history on audio, video, film is his business. This is what he does for a living. And he also, by the way, is very, very gracious to our students, so I like to throw him business when I can. If you're not feeling up to dealing with your audio, video, film yourself, which I completely completely understand. Uh, talk to Joyle, he will treat you right. There are also various online services that you can just box all your stuff, ship it off, and they'll ship it back. Um, but I like to buy local when I can, so, uh, so I like to um, 
to recommend Joyo. If you ever are down in Madison, you can come up actually to see my rig. I would love for you to do that. You are also welcome to use it. Um, that's my give back to the community, which has given a great deal to me and to Rep. There are instructions there for kind of the 80 20 point of what most people have, which means um, cassette tapes, VHS, VHS compact, mini DV. I have a slide scanner um, attached to my, to my everybody can use this device. Um, and there may be a few other things you can just talk to me about. But yes, you're welcome to drop in. And uh, if you just have one or two things. The thing about audio and video digitization that makes it kind of a pain in the butt, and a big reason that a lot of people outsource it, is that the, you digitize these things in real time. You actually pop them into the cassette player and play them back into the computer. So if we've got a 90 minute tape here, that's 90 minutes you're tying up the computer trying to digitize the darn thing. So if you're like, ah, there's enough time in the world for you to mess with that stuff, outsource it. You have my blessing. It's fine. All right. I'm going to step over and pick up a few things. Thing, this thing and this thing. Okay. I didn't pick up the cassette player, it's still over there. Um, if you don't have a cassette player, but you do have cassettes, for a lot of things it's actually quite tempting and perfectly reasonable to go to your local thrift shop and just buy the equipment you need if they have it. That's actually I have a, a lot of what's in rad. I came by that way. For cassette players, though, I don't recommend it because you don't know what kind of shape that, that, uh, that deck is in. And with Walkmans, particularly, they've been, they've been used and abused, and you can't trust them. <laughs> that said, I'm looking online, and there are actually several pretty good um, audio-video repair shops here in Appleton, Seuss Electronics. Um, knows what they're doing and, uh, and can repair stuff for you. So if you would like to do that, um, there is recourse uh, very, very locally. So, oh shoot. And the one thing I meant to pick up, I did not pick it up, so let me go get it. <coughs> your audio that way. I don't recommend it. Um, computer sound cards, frankly, are garbage. <laughs> They're just not very good at picking up the sound. So what I recommend instead, and this is probably the oldest model of these that you can still force to work. Uh, not recommended. You have to dink around with Windows. Um, this is, my kids are five years old, so they kind of show it. But, this is a gizmo called an audio interface. And that is the search term you would use for it, audio interface. Um, it has, you know, plugs where you plug in the, the, uh, the plugs that come out of your device, whatever it is, and there are several different kinds of these. And, uh, oh, I didn't show you my secret weapon. They own my soul by now. Ah, are you kidding me? <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway. Right? Yeah. Um, if you need a particular kind of cable that you don't have, or an adapter that you don't have, Monoprice is the way to go. Monoprice.com. 
They have not quite everything, but almost everything that's in common use on consumer <coughs> audio and video, and they have it cheap. <laughs> Their prices are amazing. Uh, and as I said, they own my soul. All right, so right, audio interfaces. You totally buy these used, it's fine. Just before you buy one used, go to the manufacturer's website because this does actually plug into your computer and make sure that there are drivers, right? Make sure that there's software for the operating system on your computer. Now, if you have a, if you yourself are techie or you have a techie friend, um, or, or relatives, it is possible on Windows, at least, don't try this on a Mac, um, to force Windows 10, for example, to pretend it's Windows 7 for the sake of running a particular driver will usually work with these. I would say don't go back any further than Windows 7. You're asking for hurt. Um, this heck, this thing, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, Windows XP. Had to get Windows 7, I think is what I've got on the laptops here, to behave like Windows XP. Did manage to do it. Windows 10 does not like to behave like Windows XP. Uh, so if it's got drivers for Windows 7 or later, you're fairly safe. Um, the other caution with audio interfaces is make sure it's USB. Older audio interfaces used um, a, what do I want to call it, standard uh, protocol slash technology slash whatever, called Firewire, mm -hmm. which is dead as a doorman. Um, it will come back. We will see it again in a little bit. But yeah, don't buy a Firewire audio interface. Make sure it's USB. You don't need the hassle, trust me. USB 2, USB 3, but it doesn't matter. USB 2 is fine. Um, the nice thing about these is that you can plug pretty much any piece of consumer audio gear into them. So I, somebody has vinyl, you totally plug the record player turntable into an audio interface, not a problem. Um, do you need a preamp? Nah. If you have one, it's fine. Um, you don't need it. Cassette tapes, mini uh, uh, micro cassette recorders that play those answering machine tapes, you would need the right cord, which you would get from Monoprice, but otherwise, no problem. Um, was there any other? Oh, open reel tapes. Right. Because some of you said you have them, I want to talk about those briefly. They scare me. Um, and when I started out doing this work, I didn't know to be scared. But people kept sending them my way because not that many people have open reel tapes anymore. And it's a special case of question three, should I worry? And yes, if you have open reel tapes, please get them dealt with as soon as you can. You should worry. The reason that you should worry uh, may sound odd to you, because when open reels were the thing, one of their selling points was actually, yes, these are made to last. You can trust these tapes. They'll be great forever. And it turned out not to be true. I had a batch of open reels sent to me from uh, the University of La Crosse, their library and archives, and they had been impeccably stored, right? All archival everything, climate controlled environment. They should have been in beautiful shape, and they were not. It turns out. It does matter, I mean, the conditions that you store them in does matter, totally does matter. But the other thing that matters is um, the tape manufacturer and the tape model. Because some of them were just, I'm sorry to say this, garbage. 
what happens to them. And if you have open real, this is a term you might want to scribble down so you can type it into a search engine later. Um, what happens to them most frequently is something called sticky shed syndrome. And sticky shed syndrome is when these things get, get a little moisture in them. And so the, the particles that are carrying the sound kind of lift off of the, the binder. And so if you try to play them back on, on your deck, a couple of, well, many bad things can happen. Um, the good thing is you will hear it right away because you will hear this deafening, horrible squeal. If you start playing back at the real tape and it starts squealing at you, stop it. Right? Stop it right then. That's sticky shed syndrome. And because those particles are kind of loose on the binder, they come off the tape very, very easily. So you damage your tape if you keep playing. The other thing is that to the deck, a sticky shed tape feels very mushy, right? So the deck is working harder to keep the tape running, and you get, in very bad cases, you can burn out your deck motor that way. So not only are you damaging your tape, you're also damaging your deck, and let me tell you, those are not cheap to fix. So if you hear it squealing, stop it right away, I bet you. So what do you do about sticky shed syndrome? Um, I bless Katie Mullen, the audiovisual archivist who told me this. If you're in archives, you can buy an actual oven for these things. That's six thousand dollars and up. <laughs> did I have that kind of money? I did not. So Katie's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. You don't need a specialized tape baking oven. What you need is a food dehydrator. I was like, really? <laughs> oh, um, she says yes. Because what you do with the sticky shed tape is you bake it at about 125, 130 degrees for four to upwards of 12 hours. It can take a while. Um, but a food dehydrator does that beautifully. Circulates the air nicely, keeps it in a very constant temperature. And I can tell you from experience, it works. Yeah, I mean, if it's the right temperature. Check it to be sure, but yeah, it could work. I don't know, do those things circulate air? They do? That's bad. Worth a try. Worth a try. Uh, but yes, that is the secret to sticky shed syndrome. Get a food dehydrator. Uh, the story I will tell about that, Bangor and Area Historical Society outside La Crosse got in touch and they said, we have this open reel tape. We have nothing to play it on. Can you help? I said, sure. Send it my way. What are we looking at? And so the tape came, and it was, oh boy, squeak! <laughs> <laughs> terrible, awful noise. Um, so I emailed Greg Wagner back, and I said, I have to bake this. Is it OK with you? Should work. But if you're worried about it, I'm not going to do it. He said, sure, give it a try. So I did, and it was fine. I got a great capture off it, and it turned out that what was on the tape was an interview by a local 11-year-old named Peter Holland of his best friend. Uh, this was 1961, by the way. Um, so Peter Holland, who, by the way, is still around. I, I looked him up. Of his best friend, 85-year-old John Davis, Ho-Chunk Elder. Hmm. Yeah, I said, wow, this is a Wisconsin treasure that I have in my hands here. How great is this? And yes, we got a clean capture, no further damage to, to the tape or the deck, and I was just thrilled. I would take some pretty good odds that there are some Wisconsin treasures represented by you here in this room. I have no trouble at all believing that. All right, so open real tapes, they scare me. You should deal with them as quickly as you can, but it's not the end of the world. There are things you can do. Woo, let me not, oh, right. OK. That's all that I was going to say about sound. Are there any sound recording formats that people wanted to ask me about? Yeah. I can recall my father having 
with people in the garage. And he had a wire tape. A wire wow. Uh, my mother refused to talk into the microphone mm -hmm. because you could, you could record on the wire. Yeah, you'd have to go to the pros for that. I don't even have one. If anybody finds a wire, wire recorder player, I want it. But I haven't laid hands on one yet. Um, yes. The folks I would trust most um, for, for wire recordings, you're going to have to sweet talk them because they mostly work for uh, at poll organizations. Uh, but say my name, they might fit you in. Northeast Document Conservation Center. I know these folks have, have wire recording machines. Anybody got transcription discs? Wow, those are the greatest. Um, they're, they're like vinyl records, but they're seriously like this big around. They're huge. Did I see a hand back there? Yeah. Are there different file formats to digitally record the stuff onto your computer? I'll get to that. I will get to that. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, there are, let's say, good ideas, better ideas, and not so great ideas for a lot of this stuff. Any other sound recording gizmos? I'm amazed. Wax cylinders, again, I would go to NEPCC if you happen to find any of those. Um, by the way, I can do eight track tapes. Like, I never thought I would need to. Because to me, eight track tape, I mean, those were made for playing in your car. Right, so this is all commodity music. Mm. It's all been remastered by now. Why would I ever need an eight track tape player? But I would go to events and people would try to gotcha me. Can you do this? Can you do that? And they, they would, I would always get stuck in eight track. So I was like, I saw one, I shot the wheel. I was like, fine. So I bought it. And then Mineral Point Library and Archives comes to me um, with the by now traditional two boxes of various media, some VHS, some cassette tapes, a few open reels. Um, and what is this? An eight track tape? Are you kidding me? There was actually an oral history on it. I didn't even know anybody made eight track tape recorders outside of music studios. But somebody must have had one, <laughs> because as far as I know, that was the only recording of this oral history that I made. But hey, got a capture. So if you run into the fair, I, I would be shocked if any of you ran into an eight-track tape that wasn't like Elvis. <laughs> but if you do, I got your back. <laughs> All right. Phil. Um, 8 millimeter, 16 millimeter, Super 8. Uh, Super 8 is really, really common in the, in the consumer market. Uh, go, go to Holder Printworks. Don't try to deal with this on your own. Um, you'll, what you get back will be better. Uh, is there a way to do it within a normal human being's budget? Yeah, but it's not great. Get a projector. Project it against a wall, get a nice sharp picture, and then turn a digital camcorder on it. The result will be really flickery and not great, but it'll work. Um, Holder Printworks has the equipment to do it right. I don't, by the way, if you have film, you don't want to come to me. I do actually have a, a 16 millimeter film digitizer, but one, I haven't had time to hook it up and test it yet. And two, I was warned by the person who donated it to me that if the film is at all warped, which is not uncommon, it happens quite a bit with, with older film, um, that the, the machine that I have is not very kind to it. It may actually rip it. So go to Joyal, please. Um, I'm a little bit scared of that machine, actually. <laughs> Another thing about your film. Every so often, I don't know if this is going to sound completely bizarre, but it's, it's real. Smell it. Does anybody happen to know what you're smelling it for? 
Does it smell like vinegar? Does it smell like vinegar? So the history of film, there are several different chemical formulations of, of film stock. One of the earliest ones is, is nitrate, also called silver nitrate film. Um, and please, if you have any of that, be extremely, extremely careful with it because it goes kaboom. Uh, it, it, will, it will catch on fire and or explode spontaneously. Um, if you have film that dates back, I would say the early 1940s or earlier, I would be really concerned um, and talk to a film person and, and find out what kind of stock that's on because seriously, nitrate film is dangerous. Um, once everybody figured out, and unfortunately there were quite a few deaths involved, that, that nitrate film was not a good idea, <coughs> film stock kind of went in two directions. One of them was uh, polyester film stock, which is what I hope you all have, because that's actually pretty stable. You still want to store it right. But polyester film does okay, for the most part. Um, it's acetate film <coughs> that can give off that vinegar smell, because vinegar is what? Acetic acid, right? If any of your films smell like vinegar, get them dealt with, because that's a signal that they are deteriorating. There's no way to stop vinegar syndrome once it's started. <coughs> once it has gotten started, it tends to accelerate. And it's, it's also contagious. If there are other acetate film cans in the vicinity, it will actually spread to them. So if you smell that vinegar, please worry and please get that dealt with. Um, I wish there was some way to fix it. There isn't. The best you can do is get it digitized. Um, bright side is that to the best of my knowledge, you won't actually damage digitization equipment by putting acetate film on it. That's OK. Um, you want to clean it afterwards, of course, because you don't want to communicate um, to any other films. But uh, it should be fine. So yeah, vinegar syndrome, kind of the worst. Be careful with it. Uh, do any of you have microfilm or microfiche? Probably unlikely. You do. Uh, smell those two. I didn't realize those could be on acetate stock, but it turns out they can. If they don't smell like vinegar, you're probably fine. Um, again, polyester stock, and those were actually designed by chemical engineers to be long lasting. Um, but acetate was a mistake. <laughs> acetate should never have happened, and yet it did. All right, video. We'll start with VHS, because that's what a lot of people have. <clears throat> you can go on to your favorite um, shopping boutique. Uh, I'm not a fan of Amazon, so I try not to use them. But New Egg would certainly have these. And you can get these little USB dongles. And I've taped it to the, to the cord here, but the dongle actually ends here. Um, Roxio is the brand name for this one. Elgato is another brand name that a lot of people um, swear by. And these, they come with their own software. You can get them for both PC and Mac. Um, not that the dongle really matters, it's the software that's uh, operating system specific. And they work with a regular ordinary VCR. Um, basically, the, the the red, white, and yellow that you're used to from as the outputs on your VCR, plug right into this thing. If you ha happen to have an S video, not super common, but not unheard of either, um, they work too. And uh, the software is just basically, okay, I am running now, play back the tape into me, and it's really that simple. These are not at all hard to use, and they're not expensive, under 50 bucks. I'll go ahead and pass this around so people can take a closer look at it. Um, to get to your question about file formats, you can burn DVDs 
for most of these um, most of these kids memos, do I recommend that? No. Because again, DVDs are on their way up. The other reason I don't recommend DVDs is that anybody happen to know how much data, how much digital data a DVD will hold? No, not that. No, no, no. It's like 4.7 gig. Unless it's a dual layer, but man, those are, uh, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't put this. Um, it's not a lot. <coughs> and if anybody's actually watched a movie DVD, not a Blu-ray, but a DVD, on a really big screen, and you've noticed weird little blocky artifacts type things, um, that's why. You can't really fit a whole bunch of data on a DVD. And video is a whole bunch of data. So they really squeezed down movies as small as they could to get them on those DVDs, meaning that if you digitize the DVD, you're not getting the highest quality you could. So what almost all of these will also do is um, save you out what's called an MP4 file in H.264 codec. Codec, oh, I hate having to explain this. Um, for both audio and video, think of it like a casserole in a casserole dish. You can make all kinds of different kinds of casseroles in the same casserole dish, and you can make shepherd's pie, whatever, in lots of different casserole dishes. So ca the casserole is a codec. The um, casserole dish is a container format. What you want is to forget all that and just remember H.264 and MP4. It's not the highest quality there is, but it's good enough. Um, if you can get H.265, that's actually a little bit better, but I don't think most of these little gizmos will actually do it. So, H.264 and MP4 will do. There may be a slider. I know there is in the Roxio software that says that's kind of a smaller size, lower quality, more quality, higher, higher file size. Go ahead and, and floor that. Tell it to give you the best quality it's got. Because if you're not saving it to a DVD, which you're not, you don't care how big the file is. Yeah? Um, those uh, little, uh, from a camcorder, those yeah. smaller tapes that fit into the parent ah, yeah. VHS. VHSC? Yeah. How long a duration are those? I can't remember how long those little things are. That's a good question. I think so this is all real 30 tiny. to 60 minutes. Okay. Um, that's my guess. But the thing about VHS is that the, the tape speed, both the camcorders and the decks give you standard play, long play, like extended play. Extended play is like six oh. hours on a single. Oh. Yeah, it's terrible quality. Yeah. Um, but you know, if it's what you've got, it's what you've got. So for the compact VHS, ah, did not mean to do that, but that's okay. This is your solution, and you can get these on Amazon. Um, you actually pop the compact VHS tape in here. They're, they're battery operated. I use this so rarely, I don't remember where the battery, oh, here's the battery compartment. <laughs> Where's the battery compartment? So standard AA battery, nothing, nothing outrageous. Um, uh, what's outrageous that I can't get the battery cover back on? Okay, there we go. So you push the thing, this opens up, you put the tape in here, you close it, it makes terrible noises. And then this is a normal VHS. Tape size, so you just pop it into your VCR as normal, and it will rewind, fast forward, play back as normal. The actual tape is the same size. The only thing that's different is the, is the container size. And this is what you can find these again on, on Amazon or QA or wherever. Um, what's the magic phrase? VHSC cassette adapter, or does VHSC adapter? I don't know. I don't know what you're looking for. Absolutely. Pass that around. Those are actually pretty cool. 
because somebody brought me one. I had no idea what to do with it. Um, I thought I would have to actually get one of the VHSC camcorders, which if you have one, that will also work. Um, they will usually have uh, outputs that you can plug into the Roxio thing and you're fine. Um, but no, it's not hard at all. You just get the adapter and, and go to town. All right. I promised you that Firewire was coming back. Firewire is coming back. Um, and it's for these. Mini DV, mini digital video tapes. A lot of people, a lot of people have them. I had one when I was younger. Um, camcorders are still fairly easy to come by. Thrift shops, shop goodwill, uh, garage sales, whatever. Um, I spent a lot of time garage sailing for rat, actually. Um, and unlike a, a VHS VCR, these were actually designed to hook up directly to a computer. The problem is that they did it with Firewire, which is dead as a doornail. Yeah, yeah. So, your options if you want to do this yourself. If you have a desktop computer, not a laptop, but a desktop Windows machine, that you can open up the case, and you have a free, what's called a PCI or a PCI Express <laughs> slot. Um, I will show you my other. My other secret weapon. They're called StarTech. And RetroTech isn't everything that they do, but they do quite a bit of RetroTech. And let me do. No, oh, come on. Okay. And you get a little gizmo like this, which actually, once you crack the case, you just plug it right in to the slot where it goes and install a driver and then you have the then you get the cable and you it works. It works. Any Mac people in the room? We do have a few Mac people. Okay. Um, this gets a little annoying, <laughs> but it will work. Um, your Macs, roughly what year? 2016. Okay. That was the interregnum. Do they have I want to do this, sorry, just for a second. Do they have the newer USB-C? No. no, older, good. What y'all want um, is a dongle that you can get from Apple. So go to the Apple store and search Firewire, and you'll find it. It is a Thunderbolt 2 to Firewire dongle, and it works. I have made it work on my work machine, which is a little bit older than this one. If you do have one of the newer Macs, as I do right here, one of the so-called USB-C, Thunderbolt 3, uh, then you need two dongles. You need the dongle I just talked about, Thunderbolt 2 to Firewire, and then you need the Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 2. It's ridiculous, but it works. Your other option is go to older Brickworks. Make it his problem. Or you can come to me in Madison. I actually do have a, a camcorder hookup um, to one of these cards, actually. It's already plugged in, all the drivers are installed, you don't have to worry about it, you can just play back to the chain. One thing to be aware of, because it, it actually bit me. <laughs> it bit me in the past. Um, there's a later variant on mini DV tapes that, uh, that's called HDV, high definition digital video. Same size tapes, you won't necessarily know until you pop it into your camcorder and it won't play anything intelligible. Um, yeah, you need a different camcorder for that. They're harder to find 
Um, I have a couple. One of them was bequeathed to me um, by actually a media lab on campus that was shutting down. And they said, hey, Dorothea, would you like to come over and get some equipment? I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> Let me see what you got. Uh, I got many good things from them. So if that's the case, come and talk to me, because I do have HDV cameras, and I can, I can deal with that for you. Um, Betamax, go to the press. Bring it to me, um, take it to Joyal. I think Joyal can do Betamax. Uh, theoretically, a Betamax player should hook up with a Roxio or Elgato, but I've tried it and I've never managed to get it to work. Um, you need to go up a level to the more sophisticated capture devices. Um, I can't get the cheap ones to work. I mean, maybe you can. <laughs> I am not all knowing here. Um, all right. Is there anything else that I wanted to? Okay. Anything else on the analog side of the fence that we want to talk about before I do digital real quick? I sort of missed your yeah. recommendation on storing the video capture. Yeah, dry and cool. Oh, uh, like the file format? Well, um, you know, you said not on DVD. Not on DVD, so right. On Save it out as a, as a file, as a digital file, as an MP4 file. And it will just be a file on your computer like any other file. And then back up. And then back up, yes. Okay. As you normally would. Yep. Yeah. Do you put anything on the cloud? And do you put anything on the cloud? You don't, want it to, you don't want the cloud to be your only copy. Um, you don't want anything to be your only copy. Only copies are scary. Um, the mnemonic I tell my students and that I tell librarians and archivists who are, who are new to this stuff is three, two, one. Ideally, you have three copies of important data. Ideally, on two different kinds of storage. So your computer might be one and the cloud might be another. That's fine. Um, with one that is far away from you geographically, right? That's the no tornadoes clause. Um, if heaven forbid a tornado or a flood wipes you out, if you have that copy that's far away, it is still safe. Yeah, because it's not local. Right, it's not yeah. local and we have that forever. Right. Yeah. Did you did you say like if I have the old Super 8 films? Yeah. Did you say to put them on DVD or not on DVD? Not on DVD. Save them as an MP4 file. Okay, so the DVD, the, the films that I had put on the DVDs. I would rip those DVDs. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is software for that. It is free. It is called handbrake, yeah. like the handbrake that your car used to have once upon a time very long ago, um, H-A-N-D-B-R-A-K-E. It will deal with your DVDs, no problem. All right. So digital. These are easy. These are actually super easy. You can find external three and a half inch floppy drives. Not too long ago I could even find them new, which shocked me. I had no idea. Uh, but they're super easy to find used. And they will just plug into your computer. Um, Mac folds. It's a little less easy for you. <laughs> Apple is very bad at backward compatibility. Uh, they just, they don't like to do it. Um, there is software that will help you. It is called Mac Drive. It's not cheap, but it's not horrible. Uh, could be worse. Um, right, so these are easy. Grab the drive, plug it into a Windows box, no sweat. Um, Look, where's my phone? Zip disks. Actually, also easy. Super easy. If you can find an I'm 
when they did zip drive? They're USB. There are some older ones that are SCSI, S-C-S-I. Don't buy those. You don't want to deal with SCSI, trust me. Uh, but there are plenty of USB ones out there, and you plug them in and they basically just work. These bad boys are a problem. Bring <laughs> um, them to me, I can, do, I can deal with them. But if you're bound and determined to do it on your own, I can tell you how, but I don't really recommend this. Yeah. So if you have like old computer parts and you would have an old five and a half quarter floppy drive, you should be able to interface that into your computer, yes? Yes, but you need a piece of magic to do it. I will okay. tell you where to get that. Okay. I think I got the whole one. If you're bound to turn. Um, it's a dude seriously doing this out of his garage, deviceside.com. FC5025 USB and five and a quarter inch floppy controller. And wow, that's a mouthful, but I have one. I have several actually. Um, and, and they work. I'm not a fan of this guy's software interface design, but I don't care. I can read five and a quarter inch floppy disks. So yes, if you have a drive, um, the the controller. Let me actually. Where did my oh, there it is. Oh. Wow, that's this. Okay. So the controller itself is 55 bucks, totally reasonable. Um, you will probably also need the tabletop power supply for the drive, which you will have to yank out of your machine. Uh, but that's another 25, and that's it. That's all you need. 100 bucks and you're good. Um, won't be fun, but yeah, you can totally, totally read these bad boys. Um, putting on my archivist hat. Although no, actually, he's got a built-in right blocker, so never mind, it doesn't matter. Any more questions? Over at the side of the room um, are my, our chunks, I didn't unpack everything, of my actual kits that, that I bring to places to actually do this work. One of them is specifically for audio video, that one's called Pravda, and the other one is for digital, and that one's called Proud. Um, so if you're curious about any of my equipment or how I came by it or how I hook it up, I am happy to show that to you. I will also make note that there is a terrific book display over in the corner, and that was Katie's work, not mine. Um, well, there's lots and lots of really good books about this stuff. Um, you can also, the magic of interlibrary loan, the information school library at UW-Madison where I work, we have lots and lots of really good books on, on this stuff, and you totally can't get your hands on them through interlibrary loan. All right, any last minute questions? So what would you recommend for backing up? Yeah, what I recommend to most people is external hard drive. Um, depending on what you have, it probably doesn't even need to be that huge. Uh, you can get a cheap 500 gig one, and for most people, that's enough. Um, one terabyte is more than enough unless you've got really a lot of video. If you have really a lot of video, then go big. Uh, with a second copy in the cloud on Google Drive or Dropbox or Box or I use Spider Oak um, because I'm paranoid. <laughs> and, but any of those, any of those would be fine. And then just every so often, check where you're at. Make sure that your cloud provider is still in business. Um, make sure they haven't gotten sued. Uh, business risks, man. Uh, anybody heard of Mega Upload? Kim.com. Seriously, dude changed his last name to .com. <laughs> this is the kind of dude he, he is. Uh, he's from New Zealand um, originally, and he founded Mega Upload as supposedly a backup provider 
but it was a super, super open secret that everybody was using it to, to infringe copyright on movies, for the most part, movies and music. Um, so he finally got copyright infringement sued for 40 bazillion bucks, extradited from New Zealand to the United States to face copyright infringement charges. Mega Upload was shut down. As in, literally, they went to his data centers and flipped everything off. So a photographer, a professional photographer, who had his one copy of his entire professional output on Mega Upload, went to the judge and said, please, can we turn on the data center just long enough for me to get my totally non-infringing photographs back? And the judge was like, nope, sorry. So never have just one copy of everything, right? Including in the cloud because you are subject to their business risks. You want, if you lose one copy, which happens, that's always going to be a problem. You just don't want it to be a crisis. <laughs> yeah? Does that MP4 yep. format you talked about, does that apply to photos as well? For photos, um, the file format that archivists use is called TIFF, T-I-F-F. Yep. JPEG 2000 is another one, but it's not as common. Um, pretty much everything will handle a TIFF. And then to share it with people, you would probably just um, create a JPEG copy. What, what do you scan what, level 600? Right, 600 is more than enough for most things. Yeah, 300 to 600 is good. Um, yeah, Katie. Can you just mention that the lifespan of external hard drives? And Three to five years. Three to five years, typically. I just recently lost mine, so, so <laughs> thankfully check I have them. backups. <laughs> Once a year, so check them. And yeah, plan to rotate them out every few years. A place for data recovery on Madison to work with. Um, yeah, when, the, when something, when people bring me something that I can't handle, which is actually fairly common, backup tapes are really common on my campus, and like, for, like, somebody seriously asked me about nine track backup tapes from the 1970s. Um, I looked it up online, and the machine it would take to play this back is like the size of two file cabinets. You don't even have room for that, but yes. We are fortunate in this state to have an excellent, world-class data recovery outfit. And they are the aware. Don't go to them first, because they cost an arm and a leg. One of the things about being a world-class data recovery outfit is that you have to have like entire clean room labs to deal with, for example, stuff that's not caught in a flood or other natural disaster. Um, and those are expensive. And they can do the weird stuff. If you actually run into nine track backup tapes from the 1970s, go to deal where they can handle it. Um, but if it's something that's super precious and you really just need to get it dealt with, Gilware is the place to go. Where would I go before going to Gilware? Let me see if I can type. I've had a number of professional colleagues go to these folks, retro floppy. And the reports I get back are quite good. And they are order of magnitude cheaper than Gilware. Um, Gil Gilware wants an arm and a leg or your firstborn child, whichever is more expensive. <laughs> um, these folks are not, not that bad. Uh, good question. I know Gilware can. I don't know about Retrofloppy. Any more examples on our formats page? Let's take a look. Woo! They do a lot that I they do quite a lot that I don't do actually. Um, I do a fair few. Wow! They can do eight-inch floppies. I had no idea. <laughs> That's another thing. If you find an eight-inch floppy drive, I want one. <laughs> People keep promising me one, but not coming through. Um, and format conversion. You can find places that, that will handle phones. 
um, including phones that have been damaged or gotten caught or you know dumped in the let's not even mention. Yeah. <laughs> it's doable. My wife's in this 500 bucks, but they got everything off. Yep. Mm -hmm. It wasn't cheap. Yep. Um, believe it or not, consumer grade scanners that will do 600 DPI are fine. Um, for slides, particularly the higher the, the, the DPI, the better. Um, and look for a scanner that actually has a slide attachment. Some of them do. Or have some other gizmo that you put on the flatbed that you put <laughs> slides in. Um, that's the easy way to do it. What I have, not with me unfortunately, because neither of my kids has one of these, but what I have back at the ranch uh, with Brad is actually a plus tech, and they're pretty nice machines. They're pricey, um, but if you, have, if you have a lot of slides and you're very concerned about getting a high quality scan of them, um, these are, they're, I, I, I really like mine. Something to look for at thrift shops. Um, is actually just a, a slide viewer because a lot of people don't have projectors anymore and you don't even know which of your slides are duplicates and stuff like that. It can make a lot of sense just to get one of those little light bulb with a magnifying glass basically. Um, that's all they are. One of those little viewers and just take a look at what you've got um, and, and weed out the ones that are duplicates or low value or like who even is this person? <laughs> I don't remember um, because that, that can save you a lot of time and money when it comes to actually getting it digitized. And that's actually the first thing that the pros do when they're faced with a giant collection of who knows what. They try to figure out what's in there and figure out what to lead. Does that work for negatives too? Absolutely. Yep. And believe it or not, for film strips, you never have to digitize a film strip. Unless any of you are or were teachers, seems unlikely, but I've had to. <laughs> Because what you do with these, and the pros do this too, is you scan a piece of it at a time, and then you go into Photoshop and you stitch the pieces together into one image. It's not fun, but it works. There's also a company in Green Bay, Green Bay Blue, that does oh. blueprints, so they have really Oh, big they have the big scanners. scanners. Nice, thank you. Well, actually, two of them are oil paintings. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to ship those anywhere. Um, and one is from 1933, and the other one yeah. is from that era. I would say find your, um, find your photography nerd friend, the one with the highest quality digital camera and some kind of decent photography lighting setup and have them come to you. You could even conceivably look for a portrait photographer, believe it or not, right? And say, I want you to come to my home and take, a, take some really, really good photographs of this art that I have, and they will be able to do it. And they will have the lighting setups because it's very common for them to have to travel to weddings, whatever. They're, like, they're movable. Yeah, they're movable. And we, yeah, so you can even take it to a portrait studio or whatever and, and have them do it. But that's what I could do. A nice, high-quality digital camera and get the image that way. Because you don't want to put an oil painting on a scanner. I can't even imagine that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. This was really fun.